DCP Player Free. Get it now from digital.net.au. Okay. Um, I've known Leon for about 13 years now, and uh, we've become really, really good friends. And uh, I'm now 100% certain uh, all your jokes are pretty good, except I, I'm pretty certain now I have no intention of ever wanting your job after seeing that presentation. <laughs> <laughs> that is not something that... Uh, I'm very impressed with that, and I think it was a really, really great uh, learning experience. But now I'm, I'm going to turn it to sort of a different direction here. Um, and since we're in sort of a gambling town, I figure I could bet on the ponies a little bit and kind of see if we could turn that into a little bit of an anecdote in order to help understand kind of where we're headed. And so uh, Jim asked us to kind of talk about the camera to consumer, and I kind of took a, a different version of that process. Most of you probably don't know uh, much about my company uh, compared to my friends here, Phil and Leon at uh, Disney and Sony, I'm, I'm the little guy, not just in terms of the size of my company, but also in my stature. So it's pretty easy to pick me out of a crowd and I'm hard to find. Uh, but my company is based on file-based exclusivity and ultra high fidelity. I've been doing 4K mastering and 4K finishing uh, for feature films since about 2006. And what's interesting about doing 4K mastering in 2006 is I had very few competitors Equally, I've had very few customers at the same time, so it's kind of a little bit of a give and take at that point. But most of you have been a part of uh, watching this sort of, uh, this, this, this being of high fidelity, truly high fidelity, 4K plus uh, development creep closer and closer. And so a lot of these projects on the screen here are finishing pieces, pieces that I've finished that are moving more and more uh, safely and, fat and uh, efficiently towards super high fidelity finishing. But on the other side, I also believe strongly in mobilization because I believe that uh, in order for people that are really embedded in brick and mortar post-production inf uh, infrastructures, those are uh, significantly uh, uh, threatened. And I believe that uh, without mobilization of the post-production market, and that is not to say uh, that it doesn't incorporate post-production engineering, post-production support. Uh, it absolutely does. In fact, it's critical. But the post-production labor, expertise, talent, tools, and technology needs to be absolutely mobilized into the production group. And when Leon's slide showed the new post is production, that's actually a, a t-shirt that I have and a theme and like a video I've done because I believe that to my core. And I believe that that's where a lot of uh, where we're going. I do thousands of uh, production days a year on the set, completely on the set, um, but uh, manage that uh, really, really uh, in an efficient way, geared towards helping achieve a 4K plus future. So that's a little bit about light iron, but what I'm going to talk about now is kind of where we're going to place our bets. So when you think about betting on the ponies, you got to figure out what are the odds. And I think I can break down the industry into about three, the entertainment industry breaks down into about three different categories of exhibition. There, there are quite a few, but if we had to pick three, the three most significant, we'd pick probably these three. When we talk about high fidelity, we assume, we sort of correlate the size and scope and quality, sort of like when Leon was mentioning uh, Captain America, with cinema. This is where the highest fidelity, highest performance, highest production value, best attention to detail tends to exist. And the experience to the user is superior with advantage, uh, with inventions such as like, um, like THX and all the, the Dolby certification with Christie and Barco and NEC's development for DLP technology and TI's uh, contributions to that. We have a truly high fidelity world for the cinema market. I think following that, as we've seen internationally, high def over about the last 13, 14 years really move forward. We've seen the interlace standards of North America and some other countries move uh, to uh, from 480 or 525 up into the 1080 uh, market. And that's really changed quite a bit of the experience for the home user. Plus, we've seen all the manufacturers for monitors improve their tools. And then we've got the web, the sad little internet, which has which uh, you know, started very, very uh, pious in its beginning years, not really sure, very, very wild west. But these are basically the three places we get most of our entertainment. Now, if we're going to bet on these horses based on today, 
This is a safe bet. It's a safe bet to say the highest quality pictures we're going to produce is going to be in the cinema world, and the lowest quality is going to be on the internet. In fact, if we were to look at these standards today, this is generally where a lot of the content is being uh, shown. This is kind of where it lives. But this is going to be very, very different very, very soon. And I believe that if we were betting smart, if we were betting on a predictive scale, if we were betting for a world in which we wanted to make money into the future and prepare for that, we would absolutely be betting on the wrong horse if cinema was your number one investment. I believe that cinema is in danger of being eclipsed in terms of its quality and its exhibition potential by the internet not just by television. I think television and broadcast will actually stay in the center and broadband and cinema will start to change positions with one another as we see UHD plus development happen through a myriad of different technologies, everything from GPUs to new packaging for uh, 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 compression like H.265 and wavelengths and things like that. And all these things enable that. And then because the hardware infrastructure for broadband is so insignificant compared to the hardware infrastructure for cinema, it makes it a lot easier for the average user to invest and move towards a higher quality experience. Therefore, it is our obligation as content creators and the technologists and developments and manufacturers of all this stuff to make this happen in a fast and efficient and positive way. In this month's uh, ICG magazine, I was asked to write an article sort of about this subject. And I wanted to share three facts about this because I've been, um, I've been a, developing, I've been a cable cutter for quite some time and, and I, I understand that it's actually, I'm not alone in that, which was kind of reassuring. See, where we're looking at development in terms of market share, 30% of millennials are watching all their content online. Cable cutting in the millennial generation is actually uh, about a third. Uh, and that's just today, where in which we most of us could agree that the pipeline and the uh, packaging of a lot of this content is still extremely immature. When we see statistics like that, and then you weigh that against the fact that the actual delivery method for the web is still very immature, it really tells a significant picture in terms of what we can predict. But I think the biggest statistic that really struck me is that almost 80% of adults are getting some of their content exclusively through the web. Uh, that's a really, really significant uh, statistic because it shows that the ad adaptation of this technology is starting to meld. And when I, I love the apple and orange analogy, apple and oranges, uh, broadband, cinema, and broadcast, they're, they're sort of starting to meld, and we're seeing uh, people really get into that. Plus the fact that it's very, very common for e-readers and tablets to be used. And if e-readers and tablets are comfortable with 50% of the adult population, um, in North America specifically with that statistic, we can say that we're going to see a major, major improvement in the fact that those people are going to rely more and more on broadband and less and less on broadcast and cinema. So, the question that it makes me think is, well, what is holding us back? Because I actually particularly enjoy movies. In fact, most of my works in movies, I've overseen about um, uh, maybe 300 uh, feature films in terms of the workflow, post-production workflow, color science, and so on like that. So I, I, most of my life is, is pretty anchored into the cinema world. And so this is something that's kind of interesting because today in the cinema world, 80% of cinema is photographed above 3K. Um, however, 99% of it never sees that many pixels at the end of the day. In fact, the chances that all of you have actually seen 4K in the cinema is fairly low. It's fairly low. Yet the chances that you've seen a film photographed in 3K or 4K or 5K is extremely high. In fact, it's probably 100%. So if we can say that it's likely that there's a 99% chance that you've seen an ultra high resolution digital acquisition, and it's also 99% likely you haven't seen it projected, we have a gap, don't we? A gap, when I look at a gap, I see potential money, right? I see there's a revenue stream there, there's a hole, and when you can fill a hole, you can identify a hole early in the market, you end up being able to capitalize financially on that. You can, that, that those opportunities are there. So then it sits me down, I say, well, okay, if I can deduce these statistics, then how come 99% of cinema is finished in 2K? I'm gonna, I'm gonna take a little risk here. Um, 
uh, I want some, just try to, someone yell out, why on earth is 99% of cinema finished in 2K? Yell it out. Money. Visual effects. I heard that. What's another one? Money. Money. Money, okay. What else? Distribution. Distribution. Okay, let me hear one more. Storage. I didn't hear anything. Good enough. It's good enough. It's easier. Good enough. Status quo. Awesome. Okay, you guys basically got them all. Why the heck? Is 99% of cinema finished in 2K? Visual effects is the number one reason that cinema is finished in 2K, okay? Huge opportunity for visual effects people and visual effects manufacturers, visual effects designers to start understanding the ratio between what was the first session this morning about 4K perception and how something that's out of focus, something that's motion blur, something that's moving has an adverse uh, inverse uh, curve to what is perceivable in terms of resolution. In other words, the more motion blur there is, the less critical or um, high frequencies in the shot, the less resolution there is. Therefore, visual effects has a huge opportunity to produce 4K files with new filtration that may be dynamically adjustable based on what is actually in focus, right? Um, lack of post infrastructure is a huge one that was sort of status quo. The one the person said status quo or it's good enough. And status quo is one of my uh, biggest enemies. It's much, she's much taller than me and she's very mean to me. I don't like status quo very much at all. Um, and so I really, uh, but she's attractive and she's always like near me. So it's like, you know, it's just very, very tempting. Status quo is a siren and you've got to resist those sirens. Um, and then we've got uneducated users. I think a huge part of the market, especially those that borrow from the status quo and those that have invested a lot and there's a lot of uh, people in the post-production and, 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 and producing and directing and content creation world that simply just don't know any better. And so when you have uneducated users, we lose the ability to present new options. So I love looking for new options. And one of the options out there, just to show something that's a little bit more on the creative side, is the idea that we can actually take cameras that people are using today that may not even be 4K and come up with ways in order to make them work. This is a, a, a template of the, one of the most, the, the most popular camera in uh, motion picture and television today is the Aerial Alexa. I'm sure you've heard of it. Uh, this camera is generally used in a 1080p scenario. However, with the invention of last winter's uh, XT module, the ability to capture Airy Raw onboard combined with an anamorphic sensor has put this camera in a completely new category. It's the only digital cinema camera that produces um, a six megapixel anamorphic image. And in the cinema world, where we're looking for epic pictures and vastness, and we're looking for this incredible uh, you know, attention to detail, anamorphic becomes a new uh, movement, a new attraction for people. In fact, I predict on the NAB floor, you're gonna see more anamorphic glass and more anamorphic glass announcements than have probably ever been made in previous years of, of this show. You're gonna see ovals like you've never seen ovals before. It's gonna be a really, really wide screen future. And you're gonna see in glass investment. In fact, glass is a really great way to measure things because it's one of the only things in the production market that doesn't lose value. Electronically, we know that uh, cameras that are computers with lenses on them lose value uh, it's like driving off the lot of a car, you know, you uh, basically start losing value very quickly. But glass lasts a long time, so you can sort of invest in that. When I look at this, this is a couple of projects where I think this gives a huge opportunity for people to start experiencing how can we get closer to 4K. For example, if you don't do 4K right now, can we do something between 2K or 1080 and 4K? And one of the things that's really cool about Aerie Alexa's and their anamorphic option is the fact that we're, by doing things just in anamorphic in 3K, which is 25% uh, lighter than mastering in 4K, we're still getting three times the resolution that we get in 1080. In fact, the distance between Airy Raw anamorphic to 4K is far smaller than its distance to 2K. So when you think about the amount of people that are shooting Airy Raw and shooting 3K but are mastering in 2K, it's actually a very, very sad waste. In fact, it's equivalent, in my opinion, to shooting on 35 and printing on 16. It's a waste. It's a loss of fidelity and it's something that's likely never going to be achieved again. So. One thing that um, 
really ties this all together is where uh, Netflix is kind of heading. And so something that Kevin Spacey mentioned was that uh, it's the risk takers that get rewarded. That's the commonality between business and art. And I think that's a really, really uh, true statement. And I'm really, really excited here. I think we're, we're going to show a little DCP that I brought um, that kind of demonstrates a little bit of how this works. So what you're going to see, we can actually start rolling it. There'll be a leader at the beginning and then a break between the two of them. This is a 4K projection. A, I believe this is a Christie uh, projection system here. Um, and so what you're going to see right now, go ahead and roll it, gentlemen, uh, is a 4K trailer, anamorphic from Aria Alexa, that is um, anamorphic to 4K. Hopefully you can evaluate the 4K there. And now we're going to see what the web is producing. And so what you're going to see now, that was a 3K anamorphic uh, finish for Aerie Alexa and 3K anamorphic. And now we can look at what the web has to deliver uh, in response. supposed to go to the next chapter in that DCP, so if you want to just let this roll with me speaking over it, it'll go to that section. Um, you can kill the audio. So what we have here, and maybe just put the uh, screen up uh, with the uh, keynote on the sides for me. Um, what you're going to see in just a, a moment here is where this goes with Netflix, and so uh, the piece you're going to see in just a moment is the Netflix uh, 4K mastered uh, response for the uh, House of Cards show. So many of you probably have seen House of Cards and realized that House of Cards is not actually a uh, distributed in 4K right now. And that makes sense because the channels for that have not been completed. But where we're seeing the new leaders of high fidelity come about is inside the web. The broadband groups are the ones that aren't uh, falling victim to a lot of the status quo limitations. In fact, they're actually creating quite a bit of an upset in many ways 
by developing uh, solutions and requiring solutions that have a lot to do with 4K. Everything from Xbox and the PS4, which are uh, actually future-proof uh, and future-set for upgrades of 4K exhibition tools, uh, to where Netflix, Amazon, Google, and quite a few others are developing a lot of that technology. So where I believe that this uh, sort of ends up suggesting is we have a huge opportunity. You all, I, we all have a huge opportunity to really open up, especially at this NAB, which I think is going to create a massive, massive opportunity for high fidelity, ultra high fidelity uh, development. I'm saddened to say that if cinema doesn't respond to this stuff and we don't have solutions to those three major problems why most of cinema is 2K, then we are not going to actually have a solution um, that works. Uh, for where we're going in the future. So the last piece is actually very, very short. So we'll, uh, why don't we turn the sound up and watch the 4K output. This is just a, a trailer, 4K master of uh, YouTube's, uh, sorry, YouTube's, Netflix House of Cards. discharge the duties of the office on which I'm about to enter, so help me God. One heartbeat away from the presidency and not a single vote cast in my name. Democracy is so overrated. Do you just walk away? Act as if I don't know anything? The vice president just assumed office. I do know this conspiracy is not going mainstream. I think he said that. I know how to handle him. I have no choice but to retaliate. I want to obliterate him. Let's make him suffer. There is but one rule. Hunt or be hunted. Welcome back. catching up very quickly. Broadband is right around the corner, and uh, I think cinema's got to respond to that and uh, merge the differences between the two so that we can all be in a super high fidelity future. So that's sort of my horse race for today. Again, I'm Michael Cioni. Appreciate your time. Thank you.